martial art has a very, very deep meaning as far as my life is concerned because uh, as an actor, as a martial artist, as a human being, all these I have learned from martial art. Maybe for our audience who doesn't know what it means, you might explain exactly right. what you mean right. by martial art. Right. Uh, martial art include all the combative arts like karate or judo. karate, judo, Chinese kung fu or Chinese boxing, whatever you call it. Uh, all those, you see, like Aikido, Korean, I can go on and on and on. But it's a competitive form of fighting. I mean, it's not, some of them became sport, but some of them are still like not. I mean, they use, for instance, kicking to the groin, jabbing fingers at the eyes and things like that. No wonder you're successful in the <laughs> Chinese movies. They're full of this kind of action anyway. They needed a guy like you could... Violence, man. So Imagine a world where one man's fists moved faster than the blink of an eye, where martial arts is not just a skill but a philosophy for life. This is the world of Bruce Lee, a name synonymous with unparalleled martial arts prowess and a legacy that transcends cinema and fighting techniques. Join us as we look into the life of a man who was not just a fighter, but a cultural icon, a philosopher, and an inspiration to millions. A unique figure in the history of combat sports, Lee's approach was like no other. Lee was born Lee Jun Fan on November 27, 1940, in both the hour and year of the Dragon. His journey began in San Francisco, but he moved to British Hong Kong when he was only three months old. Raised in a home steeped in the arts, Lee was exposed to a world of cultural and artistic diversity from a young age. His father, Lee Hoi Chuen, was a renowned figure in Cantonese opera and film, and was actively touring in the United States, performing across numerous Chinese communities. This tour was underway on the eve of the Japanese invasion of Hong Kong. Despite the opportunity to stay in the US, Li Hoi Chuen chose to return to Hong Kong after Bruce was born. Unfortunately, their return coincided with the onset of the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, an ordeal that lasted three years and eight months. Bruce's mother, Grace Ho, came from one of Hong Kong's wealthiest and most influential families, the Ho Tungs. She was the half-niece of Sir Robert Ho Tung, a well-known Eurasian businessman and philanthropist. As a result, Bruce Lee was raised in an environment of affluence and privilege. Despite the advantages of his family's status, the neighborhood where Bruce Lee grew up faced its own challenges. It became increasingly overcrowded and rife with danger, plagued by gang rivalries. This was due to a massive influx of refugees escaping communist China for Hong Kong, which at the time was a British crown colony. Bruce's martial arts journey began under the guidance of his father, who introduced him to the basics of Wu-style Tai Chi. As a teenager in Hong Kong, Lee often found himself embroiled in street fights due to local gang conflicts, experiences that further fueled his interest in martial arts. 
The most significant influence on Li's martial arts development came from his training in Wing Chun. At the age of 16, following a defeat by rival gang members, Li began studying Wing Chun under the renowned teacher Yip Man around late 1956 to 1957. Yip Man's classes were diverse and unstructured, encompassing practices of chi sao drills, wooden dummy techniques, and free sparring without any fixed pattern. Bruce Lee didn't limit his training to Wing Chun. He explored a wide range of Chinese martial arts styles. His repertoire included Northern Praying Mantis, Southern Praying Mantis, Eagle Claw, Tan Tui, La Han, Mizongji, Wa Kung, Monkey, Southern Dragon, Fujian White Crane, Choi Li Foot, Hung Gar, Choi Gar, Foot Gar, Mok Gar, Yao Kung Moon, Li Gar, and Lao Gar. This extensive training provided a rich foundation for his later innovations in martial arts. A significant aspect of Li's teenage years was his immersion in Hong Kong's unique street fighting culture, notably characterized by rooftop fights. In mid-20th century Hong Kong, escalating crime rates and limited police resources led many young residents to learn martial arts for self-defense. By the 1960s, Hong Kong was home to around 400 martial arts schools, each teaching its distinct style. During this era, the city saw the emergence of a clandestine rooftop fight scene. In the 1950s and 1960s, gangs from various martial arts schools would engage in bare-knuckle brawls atop Hong Kong's buildings. These rooftop fights were a way to settle rivalries away from the eyes of British colonial law enforcement. Bruce Lee was an active participant in these rooftop clashes. Through these experiences, he absorbed and blended techniques from different martial arts schools, crafting his own innovative hybrid style. Bruce Lee's identity was complex. Born in America and of mixed heritage, including German, he faced prejudice in his martial arts training, as instructors traditionally preferred purely Chinese students. His defiance peaked when he severely beat up the son of a triad gangster. Fearing retribution, his family sent him back to America in 1959 for his safety. After relocating to San Francisco, Bruce Lee settled briefly in Chinatown, where he had relatives before moving to Seattle. It was in Seattle, while attending high school, that Lee's journey took a significant turn. Here, he met Linda Emery during a kung fu demonstration and their connection was immediate. Their romance blossomed, and in 1961, Bruce enrolled at the University of Washington, majoring in philosophy and drama, subjects that profoundly influenced his martial arts philosophy. During his university years, Lee contemplated earning a living through teaching martial arts, though his dream was to pursue an acting career. In 1964, he married Linda, despite his family's objections, and set up a kung fu school in their Seattle home. Lee later expanded his venture with a second studio in Oakland, California. His primary criterion for accepting students was not skill or athleticism, but moral character. Bruce was determined to teach only those who would use their skills responsibly, and not for wrongful aggression. This high standard meant that few applicants were accepted, leading to financial struggles for his schools. But for Lee, it was never about the money. It was about the integrity of his art. Bruce's teaching style was unconventional. Alongside Kung Fu, he taught Eastern martial arts like Judo and Karate, emphasizing their stylistic elements rather than their applicability in street fights. Lee's core belief was the importance of self-defense, which he viewed as a pro-life stance. He criticized traditional martial arts as being overly choreographed and predictable, advocating instead for a more fluid, adaptive style. His philosophy was encapsulated in his famous quote, Be like water. His approach to sparring was unpredictable, leaving his opponents unsure of his next move. This made his methods not just innovative, but also highly effective for self-defense. He would name his martial art Jeet Kune Do, which translates into the way of the intercepting fist. However, Bruce's non-traditional techniques and philosophy stirred controversy among other martial arts instructors. They viewed him as a radical, challenging centuries of established traditions. To them, Lee, a young man in his 20s, was disrespecting a time-honored art form. Bruce Lee's journey was not just about mastering martial arts, but also about challenging and redefining its very essence. He was a trailblazer in many aspects of martial arts, notably in his introduction of padding during training sessions. This innovation was more than just a safety measure. It was a technique to build resilience and adapt to the sensation of being struck, but with reduced risk of injury. 
Lee's approach was holistic. He believed in incorporating diverse elements that could enhance his martial arts skills. Lee's own fighting style was designed to disorient his opponents. One of his signature tactics was the use of high-pitched vocalizations before, during, and after his attacks. These sounds served a dual purpose. They were a method of expression and a strategic tool to throw opponents off balance. Bruce Lee's adoption of these diverse elements into his martial arts philosophy underscores his status as an innovator and a visionary in the world of combat sports. At the Long Beach International Karate Championships in 1964 and 1968, Bruce Lee showcased his revolutionary martial art, Jeet Kune Do. The 1968 demonstration, in particular, is remembered for its higher quality video footage. In these displays, Lee exhibited his remarkable speed and precision. He demonstrated rapid eye strikes that were executed before his opponent could react, and his famed one-inch punch, leaving several volunteers in awe. Further impressing the audience, Lee performed Chi Sao drills while blindfolded, adeptly identifying and exploiting his opponent's weaknesses with a combination of punches and takedowns. In a full-contact sparring match, Lee and his opponent donned leather headgear for protection. During the spar, Lee's Jeet Kune Do philosophy was on full display, particularly his principle of economical motion. He utilized footwork inspired by Muhammad Ali to maintain distance while counterattacking with back fists and straight punches. His defensive strategy included stop-hit sidekicks, along with a series of swift sweeps and head kicks. Throughout the sparring session, his opponent struggled to land a clean hit. On one occasion, the opponent nearly connected with a spin kick, but Lee skillfully countered it. This footage was later reviewed by Black Belt Magazine in 1995, where it was noted that the action is as fast and furious as anything in Lee's films. The 1964 Long Beach International Karate Championships is where Lee first encountered Taekwondo master Jun Gu Ri. This meeting led to a mutual exchange of techniques. While Ri imparted detailed knowledge of the sidekick to Lee, Lee in turn introduced Ri to the concept of the non-telegraphic punch. Ri adapted this technique, which he termed the acupunch, into American Taekwondo. The acupunch is a swift, rapid punch that is notoriously difficult to block due to human reaction time limitations. The key is executing the punch before the opponent's brain can signal their wrist to defend. The year 1965 brought personal joy to Lee, as he and his wife Linda welcomed their son, Brandon Lee. Brandon would later follow in his father's footsteps, carving out his own legacy in the world of entertainment. Bruce Lee's magnetic presence at the Long Beach Championships caught the eye of filmmaker William Dozier. Impressed by Lee's skills, Dozier saw potential for Lee in American cinema. He proposed an idea inspired by the comic strip The Green Hornet, one of the earliest superheroes whose Asian assistant and limo driver could be a fitting role for Lee. However, Bruce was adamant about not conforming to the stereotypical subservient roles that had long plagued Asian actors in Hollywood. He insisted on showcasing his unique martial arts style rather than adhering to traditional forms. Dozier agreed, and Bruce Lee was cast as Kato, the martial arts expert partner of the Green Hornet. Although the show lasted only 26 episodes, it served as a crucial stepping stone for Lee, introducing him to the American screen and setting the stage for his future stardom. During his time on television, Bruce Lee's growing fame began to attract a notable clientele to his martial arts schools. Among these were celebrities like actor Steve McQueen, basketball prodigy Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Lou Alcindor and a top player at UCLA, and martial artist Chuck Norris. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar met Bruce Lee and expressed an interest in learning Tai Chi. Bruce, with his characteristic directness, responded, Forget Tai Chi, that's for old men in parks. I'll teach you Jeet Kune Do. This exchange was not just about martial arts, it was a meeting of minds and a fusion of athletic prowess and philosophical insight. While Bruce Lee was making a name for himself among Hollywood's elite and his martial arts schools were flourishing, he still sought the ideal film role that would fully showcase his talents. In 1970, Lee returned to Hong Kong, where he was celebrated for his role in The Green Hornet, locally referred to as the Kato Show. Upon Lee's return to Hong Kong, his formidable reputation as the fastest fist in the East, a title earned from his days of rooftop fighting, caught the attention of many locals. This fame often resulted in challenges for street fights from individuals eager to test his skills. 
Li occasionally accepted these challenges, engaging in street fights that subsequently attracted some negative media attention. The press at the time portrayed him as being prone to violence, stemming from these public confrontations. In Hong Kong, Li faced no hurdles in casting and quickly starred in three consecutive movies. The Big Boss, Fist of Fury, and Way of the Dragon. Each film was a tremendous success, amplifying his fame. Now, with Asia conquered, Lee set his sights on breaking into the Western film market, determined to become an international superstar. Following the resounding success of his films in Hong Kong, Bruce Lee was confident enough to embark on a new project, Game of Death. For this film, he invited Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to join the cast, an offer which Abdul-Jabbar gladly accepted. However, during the early stages of filming, Lee received a life-changing opportunity, a leading role in Enter the Dragon. This film was set to be a groundbreaking fusion of Eastern and Western cinema, the first of its kind to achieve blockbuster status. Following the resounding success of his films in Hong Kong, Bruce's Enter the Dragon represented the culmination of Bruce Lee's aspirations, a high-budget Hollywood production that could showcase his talents on the grandest stage. To celebrate this career milestone, Lee threw a lavish party. Known for his competitive spirit, he invited Steve McQueen, partly to flaunt his success in McQueen's own domain of acting. In a playful response, McQueen sent a photograph of himself to Lee with a caption that read, To Bruce, my biggest fan, from Steve McQueen. This exchange was a light-hearted moment of competitive jest between two icons of their respective fields. On May 10th, 1973, a concerning incident occurred during Bruce Lee's work on Enter the Dragon. While at Golden Harvest Film Studio in Hong Kong for an automated dialogue replacement session, Lee suddenly collapsed. Exhibiting alarming symptoms like seizures and headaches, he was quickly taken to Hong Kong Baptist Hospital for urgent medical attention. At the hospital, the medical team diagnosed Lee with cerebral edema, a serious condition involving swelling in the brain. Fortunately, the doctors were able to effectively manage and reduce the swelling by administering mannitol, a medication specifically used to treat such cases. This swift medical intervention was crucial in addressing the immediate danger posed by the cerebral edema. After spending a few days in the hospital, Lee, ever the dedicated professional, discharged himself early to return to the film set. Despite these challenges, filming was completed. On the evening of Friday, July 20th, 1973, Bruce Lee was in Hong Kong, preparing for a dinner meeting with actor George Lazenby to discuss a potential film collaboration. Earlier that day, according to Linda Lee, Bruce had met with producer Raymond Chow at their home to talk about Game of Death. After working until 4 p.m., they headed to the residence of Taiwanese actress Betty Ting Pei, a colleague of Lee, to review the script. Chow left afterwards, leaving Lee and Ting at her home. Later in the evening, Lee began experiencing a headache. Ting offered him Equigesic, a painkiller containing aspirin and the tranquilizer Meprobamate, to alleviate his discomfort. Lee then decided to take a nap around 7.30 p.m. When he failed to join them for dinner, Chow returned to the apartment, but found Lee unresponsive. Despite efforts by a summoned doctor, Lee remained unconscious and was quickly transported to Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Tragically, he was declared dead upon arrival, aged just 32 and only days before the release of Enter the Dragon, which was poised to be the biggest movie of his career. The autopsy revealed no visible external injuries, but it showed that Lee's brain had swollen significantly, from 1,400 to 1,575 grams, a 13% increase. Equigesic was found in his system. In a 2005 interview, Chow suggested that Lee's death was caused by an allergic reaction to Meproba Mate, the main component of Equigesic. The official cause of death was recorded as death by misadventure. Following this tragic event, Linda Lee returned to Seattle with her husband's body. Bruce Lee was laid to rest in Lakeview Cemetery in Seattle. Brandon was only eight years old when his father passed away. Bruce had introduced him to martial arts and often brought him to film sets, sparking Brandon's interest in acting. Pursuing this passion, Brandon Lee made his mark in the film industry with action movies like Legacy of Rage, Showdown in Little Tokyo, and Rapid Fire. Tragically, his promising career was cut short at the age of 28 
when he was accidentally shot by a prop gun on the set of The Crow in 1993. He was buried next to his father where they both rest side by side. In the wake of Bruce Lee's sudden death in 1973, a whirlwind of rumors and speculation began to circulate, fueling various theories about the cause of his untimely demise. One prevalent rumor suggested that Lee had been assaulted by jealous rivals in the Chinese martial arts community, angered by his success and international fame. Another theory pointed to an adverse reaction to marijuana as the cause of his death. In the investigation into Bruce Lee's untimely death, Donald Tear, a renowned forensic scientist recommended by Scotland Yard and experienced in over 1,000 autopsies, was brought in to provide expert analysis. After thorough examination, Thierry concluded that Lee's death was a case of death by misadventure. The primary cause, he determined, was cerebral edema, brain swelling, triggered by a reaction to the combination of compounds in the medication equigesic. Amidst swirling speculation, there were initial theories suggesting that cannabis, found in Lee's stomach, might have played a role in his death. However, Tiare firmly dismissed this notion, stating it would be irresponsible and irrational to link the cannabis to either Lee's collapse on May 10th or his death on July 20th. Supporting this view, Dr. R. R. Lysette, the clinical pathologist at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, testified at the coroner's inquest that cannabis could not have been the cause of death. This expert testimony helped dispel some of the rumors and confusion surrounding the tragic loss of Bruce Lee. Further intrigue was added by the revelation that Lee had taken out two life insurance policies earlier that same year, one for his wife and another for his children. This detail led to widespread speculation and conspiracy theories about the circumstances surrounding his death. Compounding the mystery was the fact that Lee died in Hong Kong a place far removed from the global communication networks of the time. Unlike today, where information can be instantly verified or clarified through a simple video call, the distance and lack of immediate communication meant that facts were hard to come by, leaving room for rumors and speculation to grow unchecked. Reflecting on his enduring legacy, Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon stands as a monumental achievement. With a modest budget of $850,000, the film astonishingly grossed over $400 million worldwide, translating to over $2 billion in 2023 when adjusted for inflation. This remarkable success, earning more than 400 times its budget, not only ranks it among the highest grossing films of all time, but also cements it as the most successful martial arts movie ever made. Enter the Dragon was instrumental in igniting the Western fascination with Kung Fu. Regrettably, Bruce Lee did not live to witness the full extent of his impact. His pioneering work set in motion significant cultural shifts, opening doors for more substantial and diverse roles for Asian actors in Hollywood, sparking a boom in martial arts schools globally, and reshaping on-screen representations of masculinity, particularly for Asian actors. Lee challenged and transformed long-standing traditions in both Asia and America. Beyond cinema, Lee's influence permeates modern combat sports, including judo, karate, mixed martial arts, and boxing, as well as popular culture across film, television, comics, animation, and video games. Such is the magnitude of his impact that Time magazine named Bruce Lee one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century, a testament to his enduring influence and legacy. Jeet Kune Do, the hybrid martial arts philosophy developed by Bruce Lee, is widely regarded as a precursor to modern mixed martial arts. This innovative approach, which amalgamates various combat disciplines, underscores Lee's belief in adaptability and formlessness in fighting. He famously stated, the best fighter is not a boxer, karate, or judo man. The best fighter is someone who can adapt to any style. Lee's legacy extends far beyond Jeet Kune Do. He inspired countless individuals to take up martial arts, including notable fighters across various combat sports. Boxing champions like Sugar Ray Leonard and Manny Pacquiao have expressed how Lee influenced their techniques, and UFC champion Conor McGregor has likened himself to Lee, even speculating that Lee would have been a UFC champion in modern times. His impact extended into the realm of comic books, significantly influencing several writers, including Stan Lee, the founder of Marvel Comics. Stan Lee regarded Bruce Lee as a real-life superhero, albeit without a costume. 
In the wake of Bruce Lee's passing, his influence was evident in the creation of several iconic Marvel characters. The character of Shang-Chi, who made his debut in 1973, and Iron Fist, introduced in 1974, were directly inspired by Bruce Lee's legacy. Additionally, the comic book series The Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, launched in 1974, was a testament to Lee's enduring influence on martial arts and popular culture. According to Stan Lee, any comic book character that embodies martial arts since then can trace their genesis back to Bruce Lee in some way, highlighting the profound and lasting impact Lee had on the genre. His influence remarkably extended into the dance world, particularly in shaping the development of breakdancing in the 1970s. The early pioneers of breakdancing, including groups like the Rock Steady Crew, were deeply inspired by the kung fu moves that Bruce Lee popularized. This inspiration is evident in several breakdancing techniques, most notably in moves like the windmill, which bear a striking resemblance to the fluid, dynamic martial arts styles demonstrated by Lee. Bruce Lee's cinematic legacy made a significant impact in Japan, notably inspiring key elements in the manga and anime worlds. The iconic series Fist of the North Star, which ran from 1983 to 1988, and Dragon Ball, which spanned from 1984 to 1995, both drew inspiration from Lee's films, particularly Enter the Dragon. These series, in turn, have been pivotal in shaping the trends and styles of popular shonen manga and anime from the 1980s onward. Bruce Lee's films, particularly Game of Death and Enter the Dragon, laid the groundwork for entire genres within the video game industry, notably the beat-em-up action and fighting game genres. The very first beat-em-up game, Kung Fu Master, released in 1984, was directly inspired by Game of Death. Furthermore, the iconic Street Fighter video game series, which debuted in 1987, drew significant inspiration from Enter the Dragon. The game's concept revolves around an international fighting tournament, featuring characters with distinct ethnicities, nationalities, and fighting styles. Street Fighter not only paid homage to Lee's legacy, but also established a foundational template for future fighting games. Since the inception of these genres, Bruce Lee's influence has been a constant, with nearly every major fighting game franchise introducing characters modeled after him. In a fitting tribute to his enduring legacy in the world of combat sports, Bruce Lee was introduced as a playable character in multiple weight classes in the EA Sports UFC video game in April 2014. Bruce Lee and his wife Linda had two children, a son, Brandon Lee, and a daughter, Shannon Lee. After Bruce Lee's untimely death in 1973, Linda dedicated herself to preserving and promoting his legacy, particularly his martial art, Jeet Kune Do. She authored Bruce Lee the Man Only I Knew in 1975, a book that later became the basis for the 1993 feature film, Dragon, The Bruce Lee Story. In 1989, she penned another book, The Bruce Lee Story, and eventually retired from managing the family estate in 2001. Shannon was just four years old at the time of her father's death. She grew up learning Jeet Kune Do from Richard Bustillo, one of her father's students, but it wasn't until the late 1990s that she began serious training, preparing for roles in action films. Shannon studied Jeet Kune Do under Ted Wong, furthering her connection to her father's martial arts legacy. As we reflect on the life and legacy of Bruce Lee, it becomes evident that he was much more than a martial artist and actor. He was a cultural icon and a philosopher whose thoughts and actions resonated across the globe. Lee's philosophy extended beyond the realms of martial arts and cinema, touching upon the deeper aspects of personal development, self-expression, and the journey of life itself. One of his most profound quotes encapsulates the essence of his philosophy. Be like water, my friend. Water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. This simple yet powerful statement reflects his adaptability, resilience, and the fluid nature of his approach to both martial arts and life. I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Bruce Lee's journey was one of breaking barriers, challenging norms, and inspiring generations. 
His legacy is not confined to his films or martial arts techniques, but lives on in the hearts and minds of those he influenced. We invite you to share your thoughts and reflections on Bruce Lee. How has his life story or philosophy impacted you? What is your favorite Bruce Lee movie or martial arts technique? Join the conversation in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content on the incredible lives of cultural icons like Bruce Lee. Until next time, stay curious and keep sleuthing.